Hello and welcome back. This is a lecture for Plato's Euthyphro, the very first text you'll be reading in Philosophy 105. Let me say a little bit about the goal of these lectures. It's not to uh, replace your reading, but rather to supplement it. I would like you to do the readings and watch these lectures together so that you have a bit deeper of an understanding of the issues I want you to think about and talk about so that you're well prepared to discuss them together in class. As you know, the plot of the Euthyphro is Socrates on his way to court to defend himself against charges of piety, impiety, among other, among other things, and Euthyphro going to court in order to prosecute his father for murder. The dialogue quickly turns from a discussion of Euthyphro's situation to a discussion of the definition of piety. And I think that's an interesting term, a term worth thinking about. The question that the dialogue seems to begin with is the question of whether or not Euthyphro's act of, prosecu of prosecuting his father is right or wrong, pious or impious. It's a scenario that Plato constructed to allow us to pull both ways. It's a moral dilemma, if you will. And a discussion of moral dilemmas is a very interesting discussion that we can have about duties to your father, duties to the country, duties to each other, and so forth. But that's not the dialogue that Plato wrote. In fact, he very purposefully turned a discussion of those issues, issues about what we should do or the right thing to do, into a discussion of issues of what something is. What is piety? What is right and wrong? What is justice? Plato seems to be assuming, or at least the dialogue seems to be assuming, that that question is a question that precedes or comes first. Maybe it's an even more important question than the question of what you the fro should do. I only mention this because this is going to be a recurring theme in Western philosophy, actually. Maybe we got it from Plato. The questions that primarily, primarily concern philosophy in the Western tradition seem to be questions about what something is. There are issues about what we should do, but the question of what something is seems to be more important. It seems to come first. As Socrates says, the reason why he needs a definition is he needs to be able to defend himself from charges of piety or impiety. How could he do that without knowing first what something is? The other assumption that seems to be operating throughout the dialogue is that in order to know what something is, you have to yourself be able to give an account. One of Euthyphro's biggest character flaws, as we know from the beginning, is his overconfidence. It's that overconfidence that allows Socrates to rightfully ask of Euthyphro, tell me what you know. Tell me how you can be so sure that what you're doing is pious. It must be because you have an account of what piety is. And I think one of the lessons from the Euthyphro is that Plato wants to tell us that a lot of people who are overconfident about what their opinions are seem to be unable to give an account of the most basic assumptions that they're making that make them so confident in what they are doing or saying. Okay, so that aside, we can come back to it later. You know that the Euthyphro is a series of definitions that Euthyphro proposes and that Socrates proceeds to question Euthyphro into rejecting so that Euthyphro is ultimately frustrated at the end and we don't have an account of piety. I think that the Euthyphro is as much a dialogue about what makes for a good definition as it is a dialogue about the definition of piety itself. That's something you should seriously consider as you read through the dialogue. What is Plato assuming about what makes for a good definition of something? 
and what is not a good definition of something. Uncover that assumption, and you're going to find ways to think more critically about whether Socrates was right to reject Euthyphro's definitions. Let's look at Euthyphro's first attempt. The pious is to do what I'm doing now, to prosecute the wrongdoer, be it about murder or temple robbery or anything else, whether the wrongdoer is your father or your mother or anything else. The official objection that Socrates gives to this definition is that this is just a list of things that piety requires you to do. It is not a definition of what piety is, which is what Euthyphro is supposed to be offering. So what is the assumption underlying Plato's or Socrates' rejection of this definition? It seems to be that examples do not make for definitions. You can't define something by just listing something else. Is that right? Let's stop for a second and think a little bit about this before we proceed to look at Euthyphro's second definition. Is it true that if we didn't understand something in the first place, and somebody offered us a list of things as examples of that, that we don't come to understand it after that list? I'm not sure that's right. There was this word that I heard all around the culinary world many years ago. By culinary world, I just mean restaurants, restaurant owners, chefs, people like that. And that word was OFL, O-F-F. A-L. I didn't understand it. I would have liked a definition. Well, some of you understand what that word means, and some of you don't. But what if, instead of defining the word for me, someone just gave me a list? Awful. You know, brains, liver, kidney, blood. When you eat that stuff, you're eating awful. I think I do now have an understanding of awful. If someone said, is steak awful? I would say, no. What about intestines? Is that awful? I would say, yes. I seem to have come to an understanding of the word awful just by a list of examples. Here's another, much more familiar example. Early on in arithmetic, you may have been given a number sequence and asked, tell me the number that comes next. I'll give you a sequence now. One, three, seven, 15, 31, 63. What's the number that comes next? I'll give you a minute. Whenever I give this example, almost everybody comes to an understanding of what comes next. Not only do they come to an understanding of that, they're able to fill out every other number that comes in this sequence. What I've given you is a set of examples, and you've come to understand the sequence. And so when Socrates rejects the definition from Euthyphro by saying that a list of examples isn't enough to give you a definition, I think that's something that can be questioned. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but these two examples that I've given, they are examples where we didn't understand something before. Someone gave us a list of examples, and we did come to understand it afterwards. Are these examples 
where we don't need a definition to understand something. And so maybe Socrates was too early in rejecting Plato Euthyphro's first definition? Or are these examples that I've just given really a way of reinforcing Plato's point in the first place? I'm going to stop right here and ask you to think a little bit about that. And then we're going to discuss that in class. Now let us move on to Euthyphro's second definition. Euthyphro's second definition, as you know, is what is dear to the gods is pious, what is not is impious. And as you've read in the dialogue, the official objection to this definition is that as, it's, as it is stated, the definition leads to a contradiction because gods disagree about what it is that's pious and what it is that's impious, one and the same act, if the gods disagree about it, can be considered both pious and impious. And the assumption here is that if a definition leads to a contradiction, then it is a bad definition. I'm not going to question that. I think that might be a good assumption to make. But you can. You can actually think to yourself, do I think that if a definition is contradictory, it makes it a bad definition of a concept? Instead, the remark that I want to make about this second definition is that Plato's objection to it is much deeper than just the objection that it leads to contradiction. Socrates makes a very interesting point about why Euthyphro's definition fails. And I missed it the first 20, 30 times that I read this dialogue. But I want to point it out to you right here so that when you read closely, you can catch it as well. When Socrates points out to Euthyphro that the gods disagree about what is pious versus impious, I think he's making a pretty deep point, not just a point about uh, Greek mythology that we all know about, Rather, it's a point about what moral disagreement actually is. Socrates first points out that the most serious disagreements we have with each other are about moral matters. That seems right. But such serious disagreements about moral matters, he thinks, masks something that is always universally true about moral matters. And he thinks, what is universally true about moral matters is what Euthyphro should be looking to define in his definition of piety. What Socrates seems to be saying to Euthyphro, and that Euthyphro is agreeing to, is that when people disagree about moral matters, they're not disagreeing about what morality is, they're disagreeing about what falls under it. Let's look at Euthyphro's dilemma. Should he prosecute his dad or shouldn't he? Some people might argue that he shouldn't. It's your dad. The guy that died did something seriously wrong. And nothing will bring that person back, even if your dad does go to jail. Somebody else might be arguing that it doesn't matter. When someone dies and you are responsible for it, you ought to be prosecuted, whether or not something else good will come out of it. What Socrates is pointing out to Euthyphro when he makes an objection to definition two is that these two people are not disagreeing about what morality is. They're disagreeing about whether a particular act is moral or immoral, pious or impious. In general, what Socrates seems to be saying, and Euthyphro is agreeing to, is that disagreements about moral matters are disagreements about who did something right and who did something wrong. 
whether this act is right and this other act is wrong. It's about what falls under the category of right and what falls under the category of wrong. Some people think abortion falls under one category, while some other people think abortion falls under the other category. But Socrates' Socrates's insight is that they're not disagreeing about what wrongness is. They all agree universally that if it's something is wrong, you shouldn't do it. And if somebody does it, they should be held accountable. Given this universal agreement about what wrongness is, when Euthyphro gives a definition that is contradictory, he hasn't just failed because it's contradictory. What he's failed is to capture what it is that two people who disagree agree about. That is, they agree about what morality is. Let me give you an analogy. When two people look at something from far away, they may disagree about its shape. They can't see it very clearly. They're far enough away so that there is disagreement. Someone might say, that looks like a triangle. The other person says, that looks more like a trapezoid. They are disagreeing about the shape that something is. What they're not disagreeing about is what a triangle is and a trapezoid is. They both agree that a triangle is defined as a figure with three sides. What they disagree about is whether that thing they're looking at has three sides or not. Similarly, Socrates believes, Socrates is arguing that when the gods disagree about what is or isn't pious, what is or isn't right or wrong, they're not disagreeing about what piety is, only what falls under the category of piety. Let's now move on to Euthyphro's third attempt, the most important attempt, and the definition that we're going to be talking most about in class together. In order to bypass the problem of contradiction, Euthyphro proposes a definition. The pious is what all the gods love, and the opposite, what all the gods hate, is impious. This does bypass the problem of disagreement. But Socrates' objection takes the form of a question. That question, the Euthyphro problem question, is a question that you are going to see arise again and again everywhere you look, not just in philosophy, but everywhere else in the world. That's why this dialogue is so important. The question that Socrates asks, famously, of the third definition, is the question, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is something pious because it is loved by the gods? The way that Socrates explains this question to Euthyphro is actually quite funny. I'm going to use a more modern example. Consider the example of whipped cream. What is it? We all know what it is. It's cream that's been whipped. Whipped cream is what it is because someone whipped it. Right? It is whipped cream because a person did something to it that makes it whipped cream. We whipped it. And for those of you who don't know how this works, when you're whipping something, you put air into it. And when you put air into something fatty, it gets very fluffy. Something is whipped cream because someone whipped it. It isn't the other way around, right? What's the other way around? Um, people whip whipped cream because it's whipped cream. That's weird and doesn't make sense, right? Why is this whipped cream? Because people whipped it. Why do people whip it? Because it's whipped cream. That makes no sense. People whip unwhipped cream. If anything, the reason why people whip unwhipped cream is because they want fluffy cream. That's why you whip whipped cream. 
So back to the question that Socrates presents to Euthyphro. Is it pious because all the gods love it? Or do all the gods love it because it's pious? Do you still not quite understand the question? If not, other analogies are going to be very instructive. Consider one of the Ten Commandments that maybe a lot of us will accept whether or not we believe in the Jewish, Judeo-Christian, Muslim God or not. Let's take the commandment of thou shalt not steal. Okay? Suppose you accept it and you don't steal. Stealing is something you shouldn't do. Why shouldn't you do it? One answer is because the Ten Commandments says not to do it. Another answer is the Ten Commandments tell you not to steal because stealing is wrong. The reason why the Ten Commandments tells you not to do it is because the Ten Commandments wants to tell you what is wrong. Those are two very different answers to the question. Is stealing wrong because the Ten Commandments forbid it? Or do the Ten Commandments forbid something because they're wrong? That's the question that Socrates poses to Euthyphro. And how he answers that question determines the entire path of the rest of the dialogue. How does he answer the question? The reason why the gods love something is because it is pious. That's akin to saying the reason why the Ten Commandments forbid stealing is because stealing is wrong. That's how Euthyphro answers the question. He doesn't answer it the other way around. The reason why it's pious is because the gods love it. If Euthyphro had answered that way, he wouldn't have been in any other dilemma that Socrates poses for him. The rest of the dialogue would not have concluded with Euthyphro leaving in a huff and frustrated. Instead, it would have been the answer, why do the gods love something? Who knows why gods love something? They're gods. We don't know anything about their minds and their desires, but it just turns out whatever they love is pious. Similarly, with the example of the Ten Commandments. If you answer the question, stealing is wrong because the Ten Commandments say so, you wouldn't have had any problems. Someone might ask you, why do the commandments say that? And you say something like, I don't know, they were handed down by God, I don't know why God handed down these commandments rather than some other commandments. It could have been any commandments, but as long as God handed them down, they're the ones that determine right and wrong. If you answer that way, no problem. You have a definition of piety. You have a definition of right and wrong. But Euthyphro didn't answer that way. The general problem that Socrates is raising with the Euthyphro problem is a problem for any authority-based definitions of moral concepts. Authority-based definitions of right and wrong, pious or impious, justice or injustice. People have these views. What is wrong is what the Bible says. What is right is what God commands. What is wrong is what society prohibits. What is justice is what a Supreme Court says is justice. In each of these cases, the question arises, is it wrong because the Bible prohibits it? Or does the Bible prohibit it because it's wrong? The same is true of God's command. The same is true of Supreme Court rulings. The same is true of society saying. Our society today says that slavery is wrong. 
is slavery wrong because our society says it is? Or does our society say slavery is wrong because it's wrong and our society got it right? That's the question that Socrates is posing to Euthyphro. And Euthyphro answered this way. Our society says that slavery is wrong because it is. That's what all this business about whipped cream is about, right? All this business about morality and legality and definitions and so on, it's really getting at to this very basic thing. What is it that makes right acts right and wrong acts wrong? Euthyphro appeals to the notion of an authority, somebody in a position of power. And that person in a position of power somehow determines what is the right thing and the wrong thing. And Socrates' question is, do they really determine it? Is it true that whatever the gods say is pious turns out to be pious? Or is it instead the other way? The reason why the gods think certain things are pious is because they are. The reason why our society today prohibits slavery, because slavery is wrong. It's not wrong because we prohibit it. It's wrong because it's wrong. Given that Euthyphro answered the second way, he has a problem because he hasn't given us a definition of what makes something pious. If the gods love something because it's pious, then it's not pious because the gods love it. It's pious for other reasons. What are those other reasons that make up the right definition of piety? Here's a discussion question for you. Was Euthyphro correct in the way he answered that question? How would you have answered it? Take, give yourself 10, 15 minutes, write down your thoughts, and bring them to class. Okay, now that you've had some time to think about how Euthyphro answered Socrates' third question and how you might answer it, I'm going to give you an assignment. This assignment is just for you to collect your thoughts about a certain series of questions and then to get together with other people in the class during our class meeting and maybe even outside of it to apply philosophical thinking to a new category. And it's on the theme of the Euthyphro problem. I said before that the Euthyphro question shows up in a lot of places in everyday life. I'm going to present a few places where it could show up, and I'm going to divide you into groups in class so that you can talk a little bit about each of these categories with each other and then come back to the main class to see what you've come up with. Guilt and innocence. In the American system, at least, if you go to a criminal trial, 12 peers are supposed to determine your guilt or innocence of a crime. Suppose that they've determined someone to be guilty. The Euthyphro question is this. Are they guilty because the jury has said that they're guilty? Or does the jury say that somebody is guilty because they're guilty? Sports. Right now, the home plate umpire has complete discretion over calling balls and strikes. They're trying to change that. They're trying to make it so that it's automated by a high-resolution camera. Here's a question. What is a strike? Is something a strike because an umpire says it is? Or do umpires call things strikes because they're strikes? And finally, 
consider the concept of being cool. What is cool? Cool clothes, cool hairstyles, cool people, cool music. Someone might be tempted to define cool as what the majority of people consider to be cool or something to that effect. Do the majority of people consider things to be cool because they're cool? Or is it cool because the majority of people determine that it's so? And finally, we have this term that we use when we evaluate people um, that have maybe mistreated us a little bit or maybe have done something socially um, unacceptable. We call it rude, R-U-D-E. One might be tempted to define what's rude as what is socially unacceptable. But you can ask the same Euthyphro question. Is a certain something rude because it's socially unacceptable? Or are rude acts socially unacceptable because they're rude? I want you to think a little bit about each one of these and come to class prepared to talk with a small group of your peers. Try to come up with a kind of consensus about how these concepts work and whether they work just like piety, impiety, justice, or injustice, or if they're different, how you would answer the Euthyphro question. Let's finish up the Euthyphro by looking at Euthyphro's fourth and fifth definitions. These aren't definitions that fix any of the problems that Socrates posed to Euthyphro from his third definition. Instead, what I think we can learn from these fourth and fifth definitions are about the Greek concept of piety and why it isn't really this ancient, antiquated notion that has no applicability to our lives today. When Euthyphro says in his fourth definition, the godly and pious is the part of the just that is concerned with the care of the gods while that concerned with the care of the men is the remaining part of justice. That isn't a definition of piety so much as a, uh, an account of the relationship between piety and the notion of justice, a notion that we have today. I think today, the distinction that Euthyphro is making here, we would characterize as the distinction between something that is intrinsically wrong versus something that's wrong because of how it affects people. Consider the notion of injustice that we use a lot today. It is unjust by singling out a group of people and making them live in a ghetto while another group of people can live off of their labor in a wealthier and more prestigious neighborhood. That's unjust. It's unjust when we take a person who hasn't committed a crime and subject them to punishment or state punishment. This is the part of justice, as Euthyphro would characterize it, that's concerned with the care of men or humans. It's about the treatment of other human beings. But there are other notions that we use where something to the effect of we think something might be unjust even if it doesn't affect somebody else negatively. For some reason, we find these things to be unjust in themselves. What might be examples of that? Well, um, I'll try to give you some, but you might want to come up with some examples yourself. If I ask you to take an exam, but because of COVID and distancing, I say, you're on your honor that it's not open notes. You're allowed to study as much as you want to study up until the exam, but for two hours, I'm going to ask you on your honor, to sit quietly somewhere and write up your exam without looking at your notes, okay? And you do look at your notes, and you do call your friends. I may never find out. In fact, assume I don't find out. You take the test, you get a grade. Nobody else is negatively affected by this. I don't grade on a curve. 
I grade other people on the merits of their own test, not in relationship to your test. Something good happens. You get an A. I'm actually excited that you got an A. You're happy that you got an A. Is this wrong of you? Some people think so. Some students don't think so. I think that there's something wrong about it. I think that somebody who feels guilty about it is rightfully feeling guilty about it. You might consider that something wrong, even though I'm not negatively affected by it. You're not negatively affected by it. No one else is negatively affected by it. Cheating on a spouse with someone who's leaving town or someone who's going to disappear. I don't know. Maybe they have a terminal illness. <laughs> uh, like that's morbid, but something like that. Spouse never finds out. That person isn't hurt by it. You're not hurt by it, right? Maybe you feel guilty about it. Okay, say you don't feel guilty about it. Say you get amnesia afterwards and you forget about it. Is that wrong? Did you treat somebody poorly? Maybe, but it's not negatively affecting people. And the final example that uh, some people give sometimes is um, mutilating a dead corpse, right? People who um, uh, dig up graves or go to, uh, I don't know if people are like, if anybody does this, but this is just an example, right? People who go to funeral homes um, or morgues with baseball bats and then beat up corpses. Ugh. Okay. You can imagine that their loved ones don't ever find out about it. The corpse is dead already. They're not feeling anything bad. Um, it's just something that's really gruesome about somebody who does that. What's wrong with it? Well, I think it's wrong. I think you might think it's wrong. Hopefully you think it's wrong. Um, how would we explain it? Some people might explain it by saying, well, God sees what you've done and doesn't like it. That's close to Euthyphro, right? That's close to the ancient Greeks and that's close to the Christian tradition that says the only explanation of why something could be wrong is, well, if it doesn't affect people, the gods don't like it or God doesn't like it. That You could answer that way, right? If you're a more secular thinking type, you might say it's wrong because it's wrong. Not every wrong is wrong because it affects other people. Some things are just intrinsically wrong. I think if you think that, and I think that of some things, then you have a grasp of this notion of piety that Euthyphro and Socrates are trying to define. The notion of an intrinsic wrong. The notion that it's wrong even if it doesn't affect other people in a negative way. And if you have that notion, then that's what they're defining. And that's what comes out in the fourth definition. When Euthyphro says, it's the part of justice that's concerned with the care of the gods. Now, Socrates, very rightfully, takes Euthyphro to task for this notion of care. What do you mean by care of the gods? How do we care for the gods? They're the gods, right? And so on. And Euthyphro then defines his final attempt at, uh, at piety that says, um, the care of the gods is the kind of care that slaves take of their masters, right? And goes on to endorse the view that piety is, as Socrates puts it, a sort of trading skill between gods and men, something to that effect. What's interesting about this is Euthyphro once again appeals to the fact that there's an, an authority, an authority and a subservient. There's that relationship. And righteous action, pious action, good action, is a matter of submitting to a kind of authority of some kind. Euthyphro can't shake the notion that piety, rightness, wrongness, justice, is a matter of submitting to a kind of authority. Authorities lay out the rules. Doing right or wrong acts is a matter of conforming to them. And Socrates continues to challenge Euthyphro. Why ought we to submit to such authority? What do the gods get out of it? What do we get out of it? And Euthyphro just can't answer except by saying that it pleases the gods that we submit to their authority. And so Euthyphro has come full circle. Is what's pleasing to the gods pious, 
because it's pleasing to the gods? Or does something please the gods because it is pious? Because Euthyphro always answers the question, something pleases the gods because it is pious, he never satisfactorily gives an account of piety. And that's how the dialogue ends. <laughs>